Okay, greetings dear listeners. Uh, welcome to Money and Me. And today we have a very special guest with us. The man right now with me is a published author, a crypto enthusiast, and he has been in the crypto industry for a very long time. He's also the founder of Hex, and he's currently working on his new project, Pulse Chain. Please welcome Richard Hart into our show. It's funny that as the founder of a $12 billion market cap cryptocurrency, I'm a crypto enthusiast. Yeah, I sure am. <laughs> yeah. It's only... <laughs> <laughs> Well, Richard, let's start this interview by uh, asking about your thoughts on the current bullish run of crypto. As mentioned in your website, Hex.com, cryptocurrencies are the highest appreciating asset class in the history of mankind. You guys yep. even put some math over there. You said it multiplied from $0.01 to $20,000 in seven years. That's a $2 million appreciation value. Well, is... I mean, the numbers are much bigger now because Bitcoin isn't 20 grand now. It's 55 and it's been as high as 62. And then, you know, that penny starting price, even that is not generous. It used to trade for nothing, it used to trade for under a penny. So, you know, choosing a penny is just making the math easy. So it's done more than 6 million X, at least Bitcoin has, you know. So, so like, what does this tell you about crypto's impact in global finances? How important has crypto become? Uh, not that important yet, which means there's still a lot of opportunity. I mean, no one uses this to buy anything. So, right. And, and not like, no one uses it to buy anything. Almost no one has a wallet in their phone. Al like, almost no one uses it to actually send money to other people yet. So, right. you know, everybody uses PayPal, Venmo, WePay, Alipay, uh, Cash App. Those right. all have more users and more installs for their software than cryptocurrency does. And that's the opportunity. You know, if everyone had all those things, you might not have the same opportunity. So <clears throat> right now, crypto, like, yes, you can get insanely wealthy doing it, but it's not making a real world impact yet. One day it will. <clears throat> Let's talk about Hex in that case. Uh, Hex is the first um, crypto to offer certificate of deposits, CDs rather, in the blockchain. Mm -hmm. So. Yep. How does Hex achieve this? And how do you guys offer your investors such crazy returns? Well, we don't offer the investors anything. Just like the Bitcoin network doesn't offer its miners anything. Miners mine Bitcoin that they create themselves and Hex stakers mine Hex that they create themselves. No one can give it to them. So the only people in the world that can pay a Hex staker their rewards is that Hex staker themselves. It's an important distinction. Because if you have truly decentralized systems with censorship resistance, there should be and can be no central point of failure. And in Hex, there's not. Like if I die, Hex.com goes offline. The software doesn't care. There's four or five other websites that are up with different maintainers and they have nothing to do with me. And they just, you can use any one of those or you can write your own interface and you'll always be able to mint your own rewards because there's no central point of failure. So in Bitcoin, they use something called proof of work. And proof of work really means proof of waste. They pay miners to pollute the environment and spend hundreds of millions of dollars on mining equipment and electricity to then sell down the price of Bitcoin to pay for those things with the block rewards that they receive. The vast majority of rewards for being a Bitcoin miner are from block rewards. A very small component is from actual transaction fees. Because of that, you're basically paying people to pollute the environment and dump the price, which unfortunately is the security model. And that is what is required for security in Bitcoin. In Hex, it's a vastly superior, more efficient system where you're not paying block rewards to miners to pollute the environment and dump the price. You're paying only inflation to stakers who are holding the price up because so when you're staked, stake you model. can't sell. It's proof of stake for inflation. It's proof of work for transactions currently. But Ethereum itself is switching to proof of stake over the next year, they say. And I am forking Ethereum and making it go proof of stake earlier. And I already have a test net that does it. It just needs a little bit more code done so that it can be made public, which is a big deal. I mean, it's going to be the largest airdrop in history. So if you have Ethereum, you're going to get free Pulse. The Pulse uh, chain is the name of the network. Pulse is the name of the token. 
if you have any ERC 20 for the most part, unless it's one that is a bad actor that might not make it over, you're going to get free tokens on the pulse network. Very likely you're going to have a free copy of that on the pulse network that you can do with what you wish. And your private keys will just work. You change one setting in MetaMask and you will be able to transact for free. It's just awesome. Like, I mean, as long as you had some Ethereum in your wallet, you'll be able to transact for free. <clears throat> Might so even one of the, the, one of the biggest criticisms Ethereum faces is the high gas fees. So I'm led to believe Pulse is going to reduce the fees. Well, right now they're actually low, which is funny enough, depending on what you're doing. I mean, when it was $25 to send Ethereum to somebody on ETH, that sucks. When it was 15, it sucked. Now it's like $1.50. It's not that bad. It's not great, but it's not that bad. So, so just within the last week or two, the ETH fees have come down. Then go back up. And for certain functions, it didn't come down at all because they just so tripled the price for loading on data what from disk. Factors, on what factors does the fees keep fluctuating? Well, there's two things that, there's three things that change that multiply by each other that give you a fee for a transaction. One is in their yellow paper, they quote how much gas it costs to run each function in the Ethereum virtual machine. So if you want to do addition, it costs this. If you want to do subtraction, it costs this. If you want to load from disk, it used to cost 200. Then they raised it to 800. Then they raised it to 2100. The developers, Vitalik himself, just raised the gas for S load function to 2100. Well, uh, you know, if you run something that actually is intelligent and uses business logic and needs to know the historic state of things, like say hex, and you have to load from disk, you know, these data points for how, what was the inflation this day? What was the interest rate this day? These things. It, it doubled the cost of ending a stake for hexagons on top of, so that, that's just the, the gas cost. And that gas cost gets multiplied by the fee that you're willing to bid to get your block mined over somebody else, which you bid in Guay. When we started, it was like one. And now it used, it's been 500. And recently now it's just like 35 today. Because there's a dip, right? But maybe a week or two ago, it was 200. And then that gets multiplied by the Ethereum price. And that's up 20, 25x in the last uh, year. So you've got 25x, 25x higher Ethereum price times 10x higher cost per GUE times 8x higher cost per S load. And you're like, oh, it's now $150 down to stake, sometimes $300 down to stake. Well, that sucks. And, that, and, that, and Hex is extremely gas efficient, extremely uses uh, caching. So there's no extra S load functions. It uses uh, bit packing and bitwise shifts, which is called uh, bit shifting. It uses like every known way to save gas that I can think of next to Ravi writing it in assembly instead of uh, solidity. And you're like, this sucks. So I always told people like, you know, if Ethereum started to suck, you just fork the network. Well, that's where we're at. <laughs> like <laughs> the Ethereum fees are too high. So it's time to fork the network. It's, it's that easy. So my next question <clears throat> to you is, do you think uh, ETH folks like Pulse Chain will one day eventually become better or more desirable than Ethereum itself? Well, I mean, you don't know. It's hard to tell. I know that people don't like to pay $25 to send a transaction. I know they don't like to pay $12. I know I've got a video of Italic saying that five cents is too expensive. He literally is making fun of Bitcoin saying, you know, the internet of money shouldn't cost five cents to send. Well, man, uh, <laughs> I would love to pay five cents now. So yeah, we, we could become more popular than Ethereum, but you know, let's first exist and, and then, you know, start differentiating. Cause so we're off the bat, we're going to have four times higher throughput by having three second blocks instead of the average 13 second blocks you have now. We're going to have proof of stake. So there's no miners dumping the price. You're going to be able to stake your coins as a normal holder and get rebates from whoever you delegate your stake to. So they can give you a percentage of the fees. We're going to have 0% inflation and we're going to burn 25% of the fees. And currently Ethereum has none of that. Although they hope to one day have some, like EIP-1559, which they hope to do in their next fork, is introduces fee burning, but they still have inflation. And then if they are able to move to proof of stake, then you can get some rewards for you know being a validator. 
I don't think they have the delegated model actually where you can just delegate your stake to somebody else and get rewards. So, so we've got competitive advantages over Ethereum as it exists. And we even have some over Ethereum 2.0, which really doesn't yet exist. So, I mean, we'll see. So do you think you're getting it, two point, if you think... get all these tokens for free, it's a good deal for you. <laughs> Everybody that's getting all the, it's the biggest airdrop in history. Like there's a lot of people that can be very happy. But that's got a lot of people uh, talking in the Hex community. They feel your involvement with Hex is going to be limited or constrained after Pulse comes in the picture. So what are your thoughts on that? No matter what you do, 5% of people don't like it. If you give someone money, 5% of people will be angry at you. You're like, okay, that's just how it is. What do you, if you perform the world's largest airdrop in history and you can like somewhat on-ramp to that currency by sacrificing hacks that like it gives you a reason to want to acquire hacks and then it also it brings new eyeballs to the space and hex's value offer is so strong that it just needs eyeballs and people convert so if they see hex and something else they'll often choose hex because it's just better i mean hex's price is up 458x and like 500 days it's really good price performance and it's it's uptime has been a hundred percent the contract has worked perfectly the website has worked perfectly everything has worked perfectly whereas everything else in crypto is down and, and wrecked Ku, like kucoin hacked binance hacked coinbase site goes down kraken site goes down a uh, hot bit sites down right now DeFi. $30 million hack, $60 million hack, $100 million hack, constantly. Every week, there's giant hacks against everybody. And our stuff's perfect. This is obviously better. So why and do you think why do you think the competition can't uh, perform what they, you know, what they always promise? Where, where, what is that one thing? They're that all they're idiots. Lacking? They're just idiots. <laughs> they look, they're like, we have three audits. We have two security audits and one economics audit. Who else has an economics audit? Nobody. Okay. Who has multiple security audits? Very few people, very few. And who, who, you know, does modeling and testing and Monte Carlo simulations on how user behavior will affect the system to make sure you chose the right parameters. Nobody, it just, people just copy paste, whatever else, you know, is successful at the time. Like how many copy paste copies of Uniswap do you have? This is another thing that was great about pulse chain is that I could do the same thing everyone else did, BSC, TRX, make an empty fork of Ethereum, and then copy all the good projects, duct tape on a token, and there you go, ton of money. Hey, look, we copied Uniswap. So Maddox getting rich on their copy of Uniswap. Pancake Swap's getting rich on their copy of Uniswap. Sushi Swap's getting rich on their copy of Uniswap. No actual innovation. Uniswap literally had to change their license. So now the V3 doesn't come with a permissive license. They have exclusive rights to the code for two years before it becomes permissive because everyone's just jacking them. Pulse chain will reward the original uni holders because if you're holding uni, you're getting a copy on pulse chain. And then you don't have to have all these copycats depriving the original founders of what they probably should be entitled to, which is, you know, the fruits of their labor. And that's open source. So you can't really demonize copiers because the whole idea about open source is to, to copy, but I'd rather see the Uniswap guys make money than copies of Uniswap, particularly because they get hacked all the time. They just, it's just disgusting. So no, pe people don't take security seriously. They don't take enough time. They don't do enough modeling. They're not thoughtful enough. They're not smart enough. And you're just like, yeah, their, their stuff fails all the time. <clears throat> so you mentioned that Pulse Chain is going to pull off the world's largest uh, airdrop, right? So can you yeah. tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. Uh, if Ethereum were to just fork itself right now, because say uh, one group of miners disagreed with another group of miners, you'd have all your, the whole Ethereum system state and all your coins on two chains and your keys will work perfectly on two chains. Now the problem with that situation is that you have replay attacks. So you go perform a, traction, a, a transaction on one chain and then someone looks at it and copies it over and it forces it to play on the other chain because it's the same history, the same state, the same keys. And so you don't want replay attacks. So that would be called a contentious fork. And non-contentious fork, which is what Pulse Chain is, is where you 
require signatures to include a, a little bit different text. So the signatures are different so that you can't use them on the other network. So, so now you can't replay attack. It's, it's bi-directionally safe and you get a copy of everything. Right. Now we're going to manually print out some stuff that shouldn't be there. So, you know, if you're a hacker, you ain't getting no free coins. If you're a, uh, you know, an exchange, you're probably not going to get much free pulse because why would we like crypto is about holding your own keys. Why would you make an exchange rich? And then, then the users can be like, please, can we have our money? No, the exchange doesn't usually give you your money. It's disgusting. I, I hate exchanges. Absolutely hate them. Um, as everyone does, that's ever used one. <laughs> when, anytime you have to beg for your money, that is disgusting. It's horrible. And that's basically their business. Like I, I know tons of people that are always having to beg for their money and it's disgusting. So yeah, like it's, it's really easy. You're going to have absolutely everything that you had in the, in Ethereum currently, other than stuff that just gets manually pulled out, which isn't going to be that much percentage wise. And, uh, you know, you're going to either the, the supply will either be increased by 10,000 X and given primarily to holders or, you know, so the way that it works now is you sacrifice your coins to addresses. There's a bonding curve. If you sacrifice larger, you get more. If you sacrifice earlier, you get more. And then that set just exists. And then you give for free to that set of people, pulse chain. Right. Enjoy your free coins. I mean, that's how airdrops usually go. So uni token was given to people that had used uni. Torn was given to people that had used Tornado Cash. One inch was given to people that had used one inch. It's just a set of people with whatever parameters you choose. And so in this set, it would be people that, you know, sacrificed certain addresses for a political statement that they prefer lower fees and cryptocurrency transactions. Um, that's what it is now. Could be changed. Um, you know, we've got a week or two to like decide it. We have as long as we want to decide it, but I'd prefer to get it done in a week or two. And, and would like to, you know, you might just be able to mint your own ERC 20 and then that ERC 20 gets airdropped. But the problem, I love to do things that don't involve contracts because one, the fees are too expensive. So if you get 30 or 40,000 users to on-ramp to a new thing, which Hex has more than 30 or 40,000 users now. So Pulse Chain, I imagine would have much more, um, you know, now you're looking at paying a million bucks or 2 million bucks in gas fees to Ethereum. Right. That sucks. Like why? And then what do the miners do with it? They dump the Ethereum price. I hate it. So, you know, the beautiful thing about the way the launcher pulse chain kind of exists now is you're doing it without having to have contracts, without having to do transactions other than the cheapest ones, which are just sends. You'll be able to do it across multiple chains. You could sacrifice Bitcoin. You could sacrifice Ethereum. You could sacrifice, you know, probably Litecoin, right? Like other a whole bunch of different coins you'd be able to sacrifice on their own chains. And then it doesn't involve any oracles or contracts or, I mean, you do have a price oracle that you have to have a source for the price that says, okay, this guy sacrificed then, then this is the price. You do all that in Excel, right? So as long as you've got a good price feed, you can just do all that in Excel. And then once you decide, you know, hey, let's reward this set of people, you're doing that in a database and in, in editing the database values in Ethereum itself. And none of that requires code or, or contract at all. You're doing all that by hand. And that means that it's basically the most secure you can get. There's less attack surface. There's less, uh, there's less things that can go wrong. Like you, you really can't screw that up, you know, and then you're going to launch a test net with those values and make sure everything worked fine anyway. And that's just vastly superior to having to write code and hope that it doesn't have flaws and hope it doesn't have bugs and wait for auditors. All those things suck and then pay a ton of fees to run contract code instead of just a normal send. So the ability to, to, to do this with just editing databases and, and just looking at a price feed in Excel is it's the best that you can do because you can't make it more trustless. Um, this is as trustless as it can get. <clears throat> so tell me one thing. Um, so Ethereum 2.0 has got a lot of people really excited into it because it's going to you know, shift to the proof of stake model. But then a while back mm -hmm. you said that it's still doubtful if they can really pull it off. Why do you think so? Well, I mean, how, how often have you heard about things that are going to be coming to Ethereum that aren't here yet? 
So sharding was supposed to be done in like 2017. Yeah. It's 2021. We don't have any sharding. So when I hear, I know that software takes longer than people think it takes. So it, the small things take the most time, which is why in my projects, I try to limit the, the, the code, the scope increase, right? You don't want mission creep. You don't want anything to get larger. Like you want things to get smaller and simpler and, and refactor things that, you know, they're more manageable and maintainable. So when I hear like, oh, we're going to do this in X time frame, you guys have never gotten things right in X time frame. It's never happened. So why would this be the first time you guys hit a correct time frame? So I, Ethereum works okay enough for now. I'm going to make it work a lot better. And by the way, when I fork Ethereum, it should help Ethereum become more valuable because the transaction fees should be cheaper, which enables some use cases, which makes everyone happier. I mean... Even now, look, the Ethereum price is at new all-time highs and the fees are going down a little bit. Right. Maybe they're related. Maybe people like high, uh, maybe people like not high fees, you know, that is a more valuable, that's a better value proposition for users that you can right. transact for $1.50 to send Ethereum instead of $25. It's a lot, it's a lot better. So I think that uh, Pulse Chain will enhance the value of Ethereum and reduce its fees. <clears throat> So what's the schedule of releasing Pulse Chain looking at the moment? So you're going to airdrop pretty soon enough. What comes after that? So you have, you're going to have this sacrifice phase. So in the beginning, Bitcoiners sacrificed electricity and hardware time to get Bitcoin. And then Ethereum came along and they sacrificed Bitcoin to get Ethereum. One Bitcoin used to make 2,000 Ethereum in their crowd sale. They launched as a security. You gave money to a central pool with the expectation of profit solely from the work of others that had essential managerial and entrepreneurial effort, obvious security. That's what Ethereum did. Worked out fine for them. Now a Bitcoin buys you 20 Ethereum. So all the time, Bitcoiners are like, oh, all coins suck, all coins suck. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, all coins suck. Well, how come you can buy a hundred times more Bitcoin with your Ethereum than you could when it launched? Because it went up 100x times Bitcoin. Okay, well, you could quit with that, you know, altcoin suck stuff. It's not the case. Like, if you, if you cared about Bitcoin, you could have bought Ethereum and now you'd have more Bitcoin. <laughs> like, <laughs> so, you know, the time frame is within the next week or two, have, a, within the next week or two, release the final spec for like uh, on-ramping users with a sacrifice phase. The, you know, so I, I would hope to be able to allow people to sacrifice their funds in two weeks. I hope might be three. We'll see. Right. Um, I just, there's two components of the game theory. I want to add, I'd like to see some type of treasure component, maybe similar to what uni did. And I'd like to see some type of yield farming thing, maybe similar to what uni did, but there's, they turned theirs off after a while. Other people's left their on. So it's, it's a proven effective game theory mechanic that is easy to integrate because the code's already open source and out there. So there's, there's not too compelling a reason to leave it out. Pro I would like to get that mechanic in there. Downside to that is it involves contracts, but you know, so be it. If they're already audited and they've already worked for other people, they're much less risky than, than writing new stuff from scratch because they've already been tested with billions of dollars. So probably pretty cool. Um, yeah, and then the actual network, you know, we've got the network on testnet mining three second blocks. Now it doesn't have the, the historic ETH state, although we've figured out how to put that in. So that's the next thing is just to stick the historic ETH state in instead of having a version of blank chain. And then, uh, we add the validator rotation, which isn't really that hard. I mean, this is easier than X. X was way harder. Um, pulse chain is easier. So you could have fully functioning main net three months. You really could. We'll see, you know, because it depends. Just gotta make sure it depends on if we hit snags, right? Like if we go to 10,000 X to supply to reward people that sacrificed, then we need to make sure that there's not too many edge cases with contracts, not being okay with that amount of supply. It should be fine. Cause Ethereum's already designed to have a larger supply forever, but you need to test it and make sure. 
then if you run into those bugs then you're just like all right well then we'll just reduce everyone's values and still maintain a ten thousand x ratio because you don't you know if you give people with forks if you give people too many free coins they dump on you forever and why do you want to reward people that don't believe so for instance the bitcoin cash fork of bitcoin gave the mount gox trustee 180,000 free bitcoin cash which he dumped 40,000 on their heads and shoved the price down. Right. And how did that make the world a better place? That a bankrupt company run by a government appointed official dumps the price to something. How does that help the people that created the thing, the people that believe in the thing? It's disgusting. It's, it's a terrible, stupid idea. And you know, if you give people free coins and they're valid forever, and then they just sit around for a decade the, the person that just forgot his keys and, and didn't even know he had it sometimes make more money than people that, you know, sold somewhere. So the people that believed and participated, but eventually sold and tried to buy a dip that never came, they end up making less money than the guy that just sat doing nothing. Well, that's terrible. That's no good. So with this system, we're going to take those trial freemium coins to, that are being given to currently just Ethereum holders, but we might also include other smart contract enabled people because we can just include them in the in the set and their keys will just work. We could uh, include TRX people. We can include BSC people. We could very easily include, you know, other forks of Ethereum. We could even, if we wanted to, it's a little bit of extra work, but we could even include Bitcoin, you know, and we could turn your public, we can turn your Bitcoin address into a public key if you've spent from it before, because in order to spend, you need to declare your pub key because yeah. your, your Bitcoin address is actually a hash of a public key. It's not actually a public key. So for those people that have spent from the Bitcoin address before, we're able to calculate what the real public key is. And then we're able to use that to generate an Ethereum public key because they're generated in a different way. And a Bitcoin address is a hash of a public key, whereas an Ethereum address is a hash of a public key and it's truncated. They throw some of the end away. So we could give freemium coins to Bitcoin holders if we wanted to. Um, not sure if I will yet. Not sure. But I mean, we could, we could give, because of this BIP 39 kind of universal standard for creating cryptocurrency addresses, it don't really you, inc increases you, the width of the people we could hook up if we wanted to. Right. So, but don't you think it'll lead to greater adoption of Pulse if you moved on to Bitcoin users as well, if you could target them? Yeah, my, my general business self believes that. But after you get yelled at by Bitcoin Maximus long enough, you're just like, hey, you know what? Maybe next time I give away a bunch of free stuff, I don't give any to you guys because you've been mm -hmm. so mean to me. We gave Bitcoiners used 300,000 Bitcoin to mint their free hacks. 300,000 Bitcoin is $18 billion. So $18 billion of Bitcoin was used, assuming they still held it. You know, if they divested. I'm not, I'm not sure what the balances are. But, you know, 300,000 Bitcoin now today is $18 billion worth of people that minted their free hacks. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of, you know, it's a lot of money. And they minted millions of dollars, millions and millions of dollars of free hacks. And I didn't really see the goodwill. I, I don't know of a single public Bitcoin person that said a, a nice thing about free money that was given only to Bitcoin holders. That disgusts me. You know, I know people that, got $180 of Hex, went up to 60,000, sold it, never said a nice thing about Hex the whole way. Where do you think okay. this, uh, where do you think this like, comes from? They're just not good people. They're just shitty people. They're, they're lying, sycophant, backstabbing, gross human beings. If you care about privacy, does Bitcoin have privacy? No. Okay. If you care about being able to de-risk and get into something that's kind of tied to the dollar, like before a crash happens, you want to have a stable coin. Do you have stable coins in Bitcoin? No. Do you have smart contracts in Bitcoin? No. Do you have time deposit in Bitcoin? No. You can lock your funds. We don't get any interest. Do you have lending on Bitcoin? No. Do you have options? You, you, those are all central. Those are things that are centralized counterparties that are the opposite of why Bitcoin was invented. Bitcoin was invented to get rid of those counterparties. Yeah. But instead, it enables them. I see Adam Back talking nice things about Tether all day, every day. Tether is the opposite of cryptocurrency. Hey, fiat government USD sucks. Okay, well then let's tether this to something that sucks. 
and then banks suck. So then let's hold it in their bank. And then the interest rates are low, but let's get even worse by getting no interest. Let's give the tether company the interest. And then you're like, and they can invalidate your funds whenever they want. There's a key. They can just turn them off. Oh, okay. Well then yes, the USD sucks. Bank sucks. The counterparty risk sucks. Admin keys suck. Give me all that. Give me all that. Let me say good things about that. You're like, what happened to cryptocurrency, man? Because cryptocurrency is the opposite of all that. Right. Now, the interesting thing is like the highest Tether, I think, still has the highest uh, volume traded of, of any crypto cryptocurrency in quotes. But so obviously people care about it and, and use it. And it still held its peg of a dollar even after it had 630 million seized by a Polish bank. And you're like, oh, well, okay. How do you guys feel about fractional reserve? But now they've got like an attestation from an accountant that says it's fully reserved, which it probably is. Um, who knows? Like, I don't know. So, you know, I'm out here promoting real crypto. I'm out here promoting things that help people. I'm getting people to not trade. I'm getting people to not smoke. I'm getting people to not drink. I'm getting people to, to live healthier and happier lives and have been doing so long before I said anything publicly about Bitcoin at all. I didn't, in my first videos and my book, which I wrote long before I came out public about Bitcoin, they're all on YouTube and they teach how to be a better human being, you know? Right. So I've, I find the loudest proponents of Bitcoin to be disgusting. They lie. This guy, there's a guy, a Bitcoin Maximus guy that goes on television. And he's like, if you don't like Bitcoin, you don't like cryptography. Like, what is that shit? What are you talking about? Bitcoin's literally had two inflation bugs where anyone could have minted as many free coins as they wanted. They had to roll back the chain once. Bitcoin Cash developer the, caught the second one about two years ago. This is spaghetti code. It's not modular. There's not even a spec you can write to. There's only one implementation anyone uses. These, there's no security uh, audit. There's no bug bounty program. It's dog shit. And, and you're just like, so I mean, I, I don't want to say mean things because yes, Bitcoin's still better than fiat if you care about, you know, value appreciation. But, you know, even Ethereum's up 3x versus Bitcoin over the last 600 days. But do the Bitcoin maximalists tell you the truth about it? Do they tell you that they're getting their ass kicked in the price game? I mean, it just like... Hex, hex is up versus Bitcoin like 20 or 40x. And it's been as high as 142x. But Bitcoin caught up by a 3x. And you're like, hey guys, can we start telling the truth about things here? You know? And I'm the guy out there talking truth. So if you want to see some of the truth I've spread, like calling the $20,000 top, you know, uh, <laughs> just giving people millions and millions of dollars of free money, just go to richardhart.com and I give you the links and the evidence because so many people out there are player haters. They're, it's just crazy to me. You're like, oh no, you were shilling Bitcoin in the end of 2017. I was like, yeah, I was. And it went up 40% after that. And then before it went down, I said, hey, this is the top. And I got to show you the links. See, look, there's timing, timestamps, chart, just disgusting people. So I, I think that I won't give them free coins. I think fuck them. So <laughs> if you want to sacrifice your Bitcoin to, to participate and, and make a political statement and Go ahead, but like, fuck those guys. I'm not giving them free coins. They piss me off too much. Don't they should have been Richard, more honorable and more respectful. <clears throat> don't you think all coins have much more real life uh, value applications than Bitcoin does? Bitcoin's a dumb rock. You can't do anything with it. You literally can't do shit with it. It has two functions. You can mine it or you can send it. And it's pollution as fuck. And it's buggy. You're just like, hey, you want a 13 second transaction in Bitcoin? It's not for sale. You can't get one. You can wait hours, hours for your transaction to get validated for one confirmation. And then the exchange won't even let you trade it until you have like three. And you're like, okay, come on, buddy. You can do it, Bitcoin. You can do it, little buddy. How long until I can get rid of this shit? You know, it's just crazy to me. Do you think all of these factors are going to lead to Bitcoin's value dropping anytime in the near future? Well, I mean, usually Bitcoin drops 85% after a parabolic run-up. This run-up is weird because we've fallen out of the parabola, but it's been a low impact event. We haven't fallen out of it with volatility. We're kind of just drifting down and sideways. It's not acting like it used to. So the, this movement that we're having in the Bitcoin price chart currently, it's not, it's not something we've had before. So it'll be interesting it, to see how it pans out. Is it because of big investors uh, backing it up? That's probably. leading to this change. Yes, probably. There's just a lot of demand because they're doing helicopter money now. They're printing money out of thin air constantly. Yeah. So the money has to go somewhere. 
and some portion of it's finding its way to crypto and it's just holding the prices up. So they, they used to print money too much always, but now they're really, really super duper printing too much. So it just changes everything. Right. One more thing, Richard, uh, how did you get yourself into the crypto world? So before you joined crypto, like mm -hmm. what were your uh, career goals? I started my first business out of my front yard, car stereo store. Then I started a search engine optimization company and we did shopping carts and then uh, had a client that did good with mortgages, started a mortgage company, had Miracle Cleaner, sex toy store, cash advance loans, mortgages. It got up to 150 employees doing 60 million a year turnover and then uh, got rid of it, sold it, started traveling, moved down to Panama, got the hell robbed out of me. Then I started traveling Europe, uh, you know, Australia, did a little bit in the Middle East and just went everywhere and lived in a hotel five years. And then uh, it was reading Reddit the whole time, you know, playing video games and reading Reddit. And at the time, Reddit was, you know, real technical. And someone was bragging about how they sold their house for Bitcoin at a dollar. And I was like, oh, okay, that's interesting. And I'd even, even heard about it before it was a dollar. Even. So I started mining it because I had, a, you know, a strong GPU for, for playing video games. I had a 5970 dual GPU on a single card. And I uh, was just mining full blocks at home, 50 BTC block rewards solo with no pool. Didn't even cost anything to send Bitcoin then. You could send, you know, with zero fee. And you would get your, get your transaction mined. And like, yeah. Then I helped make the top at 30 and held it down to two. And that sucked. So, you know, I bought the top. All these other people that bullshit you about being gangsters, they always bought the bottom. And you're like, yeah, yeah, you bought the bottom. I mean, guess you sold the top too. Yeah, sure. People, I don't understand people. <laughs> I mean, it's just statistically evident that when you have a parabolic price movement up, it's probably poor, more market participants entering to cause that. And so statistically, it is more likely that people buy tops in parabolic rises because that's, it's tautological. Like that's the reason it's parabolic is because that's when the most people are buying. The only way that you wouldn't have that be the case is if there was like a different distribution of the size of people's purchases. And then maybe fewer people could push it higher if they're, if they're buying size was just so much larger, but so if you're out there bullshitting and lying about when you got in, probably don't say you bought the very bottom. It makes you less believable. I've run into these guys. They're, there's a lot of bullshitters in cryptocurrency. Right. <clears throat> Richard, the last question for this interview of ours. Um, in the next couple of years, where do you see crypto heading? Because in the beginning of the interview, you said that crypto has not yet reached its potential. So what is that right. potential that you believe it can reach one day? Well, I mean... I figure we're due for a good dump at some point. Not sure where, but now would be a fine time. Maybe once Ethereum's 3x from here, maybe that's an okay time too. It's hard to tell. It's really hard to tell. Um, you know, when you sell people, you see people selling JPEGs for millions of dollars. Right. How long is that supposed to last? How long are you supposed to be able to sell your JPEG for a million bucks? It's not supposed to last. And historically it hasn't. So you know, maybe after some dump within now in the next year, um, it's not set in stone, but it's what we have always done in crypto. Then you're going to get, uh, you know, when the bottom hits, you're going to get more people installing wallets. You're going to have real integration. I mean, PayPal accepts it. Uh, you can now like deposit with PayPal into Coinbase. You can now, or if not Coinbase somewhere, I think it is Coinbase. So, so you now PayPal is all about crypto. MasterCard's all about crypto. Everybody's all about crypto. And then they've done this. Like they did this at the end of 2017, but then it didn't really work out. And now they're doing it again in 2021. Cool. Probably won't really work out. But then on the next time, it's probably going to work out. Like you really you, will have the adoption. Why do you think it's not going to work out this time? Well, it's just like, it's the hype, man. So you bought, okay, you bought a JPEG for a million bucks. Now you've got a million dollar JPEG. And then you sit on it for a while and you discover, oh, you can't actually sell this for anything. Damn. Oops. The hype didn't work out for you. You know, you bought into some new project that you thought was going to be all valuable, but then it was really a rug pull and it went to zero. Well, people can only get rug pulled so often until they're out of money. And so, you know, in these environments where anyone buys anything, Dogecoin, I believe, if Dogecoin goes to a dollar, it'll be worth more than Bitcoin was at the top of 2017, apparently. 
I haven't checked the math, but it sounds reasonable. Right. Does that seem reasonable to you that something with no development, no technical merit, doesn't even have its own miners as merged mined with Litecoin is a fork of Litecoin. You're like, no, it sounds terrible. It sounds like a scam. <laughs> it sounds like a big pump and dump. So like it, when I see pump and dump things like go up vertical, it, it makes me want to like see the crash. You're like, yeah, I want to see the shit go to zero. I want to see everyone that bought that lose all their money because that's disgusting. They knew they were buying a scam. So, you know, it, it, the market can go up higher than you think is reasonable. And the number of, like how many people look at the hex chart and get really pissed off about 458X? Probably a lot. Probably a lot of people really get pissed off about that. The difference is hex is truly innovative and unique and superior. It has technical features that are vital to finance that are, don't exist anywhere else. You know, where in the blockchain is the time deposit represented, which is multiple trillions of dollars in the legacy finance world, well, hex, you know, we've got 5.5 year average lock time. We've got a $12 billion valuation on nomics.com. We've got, uh, you know, like every metric you could want is awesome. Right. And what does Dogecoin have? They have a funny picture of a dog and that's it. Audits? No. Development? No good node software. Nope. They're falling over. Well, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, I just, so if you're in crypto and you're in, into something that's useful and productive and has product market fit and is complete project, Hex is complete. It is done. And the improvements that you see around it are things that are around it. Like people, this guy named Firebun just wrote a contract that lets you sell shares inside of a stake. So right now, if you have a stake, you can't sell it. But now if you stake through this abstraction layer, then you will be able to sell shares in it. And so you'll have more liquidity. And then that'll probably make people stake for longer since you're liquid via the shares, the core stake on, on layer one can be longer. So they'll probably all be 15 year stakes. And then now people are trading shares in 15 year stakes, which to tier, which to layer one just makes more scarcity, which increases price. And so you're getting new useful features being added by the community, but the hex core contract itself is immutable, uneditable. And you're going to get a copy of all your shares and all of your liquid hacks when Pulse Chain comes out. Yeah. So it's really a lot of super awesome stuff that's happening while having 100% uptime, immutable, more secure than Bitcoin, more useful than Bitcoin software. Hex is more useful than Bitcoin, unless you need $100 million of liquidity in a day, or you need ATMs that you pay 10% extra to on-ramp or 10% extra to off-ramp. You don't have those for Hex right now. Um, but if you want superior price performance, superior features, you do have that. <clears throat> right. Well, Richard, any closing comments on any of your uh, future sure. projects? Besides yeah, Pulse come, Chain? Come to, you know, you don't want to miss out on Pulse Chain. You do not want to miss it. Come to t.me forward slash Pulse Chain com and you'll be able to read the JPEGs that are pinned that explain to you what's going on. Um, people are asking all kinds of questions. And some people have good ideas that might make it into the main net because they're good ideas. So now's the time. T.me forward slash PulseChain.com. PulseChain.com. Um, but the I like the chat room better. Hex.com. Richard Hart Win on Twitter. Richard Hart on YouTube. Just finished a six-hour long live stream two days ago. Um, had an eight-hour one before that, um, maybe a week or two before that. I do long live streams, and I answer people's questions. So. If you want free books, I've, I've written a couple free books. They're awesome. T.me forward slash Sivive, S-C-I-V-I-V-E. We got free coins, free books, free videos, free chat. Um, you have a lot of free stuff. And then if, uh, if you want to read about me, richardhart.com. That's it. All right. Thank you very much, Richard, for being on the show. My pleasure. Thank you.